Okay. All right, I'll mute myself. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Grand Rounds today. So, um, so today I'll be talking to you about um, endocrine and cardiometabolic abnormalities in adults with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, this is something that uh, I have been interested in for the last um, six years or so uh, since I've been going to the clinic um, that specifically addresses uh, this problem. So, um, so I have no conflicts to declare. Um, what I'm going to do is give you a broad outline of the problem of adults with uh, NDD standing for neurodevelopmental disorders. Some of them would be called intellectual uh, disorders and disabilities. Um, then what is the role of the endocrinologist in caring for adults with this disorder? Uh, because the main things that I'll be discussing is the common endocrine disorders uh, uh, are more common and sometimes more severe in adults with uh, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, resulting in higher prevalence of cardiometabolic risk factors, such as obesity, diabetes, dyslipidemia, osteoporosis, and others. And then there is this uh, very interesting group of uh, conditions that are called rare genetic disorders, which often have endocrine disorders and intellectual disability or uh, uh, NDD as coexisting problems. And they pose uh, challenges in clinical care and also in research. And it's very critical that we have a multidisciplinary approach uh, for the management of this uh, particular uh, group of uh, problems. And due to the broad nature of the topic, I obviously want to give everyone a general outline of what it is rather than go into uh, details of one particular condition or the other, because each of those topics can be, a, you know, a subject for a full grand rounds uh, on another occasion. So I'll start off with one uh, patient, uh, which kind of uh, puts together all the things that we talk about with uh, this uh, type of disorders. Um, this is a patient I've been seeing for uh, quite some time. Uh, he was diagnosed uh, with Prader-Willi syndrome when he was around three years of age by genetic testing. Uh, he has moderate intellectual disability. He steadily gained weight. So when I first saw him uh, when he was 21 years old, he was 278 pounds. His BMI was about 46. Um, and then he gained weight further. His uh, highest weight was 340 pounds. Uh, now he's at 318 pounds with a BMI of 56.78. Uh, some of this weight gain was related to the fact that he had a, a fracture of his tibia with a motor vehicle accident, and that kind of made him uh, immobile for almost a year, so he gained a lot of weight. Uh, he has poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, uh, has been on different medications. A1C has ranged from as good as 6.9% to as high as 10.4%. And his most recent, recent regimen includes metformin and canagliflozin, uh, which is Invokana at maximum doses. He's taking Trulicity, 3 milligrams uh, per week. And he's also on U500 insulin, 210 units three times a day. So he's on, uh, he's you know, markedly insulin resistant. Uh, he has microalbuminuria um, at 296 microgram per milligram of creatinine. Hyperlipidemia with uh, triglycerides, which were in the 700s. Uh, he's currently on mesipa and phenofibrate. They're doing much better with the most recent value at 151 milligrams per deciliter. He also had hypogonadism. Uh, he had been on treatment when I initially saw him. His uh, level initially at age 22 was uh, 25. Uh, his SHBG was um, uh, 13 nanomoles per liter. Zelich and FSH were in the low normal range. He's currently on testosterone injections, 150 milligrams every two weeks. And he has uh, obstructive sleep apnea and is on CPAP. So this kind of, this is the type of patient who kind of ticks off everything that we need to talk about uh, in this particular topic, in the sense that uh, he has a rare genetic syndrome, he has neurodevelopmental disorder, he has metabolic problems, he has an endocrine disorder. So uh, certainly is uh, a challenge, and he's only 27 years old. So uh, this is a, a, an issue that needs to be addressed uh, over 
the next uh, several decades. So this requires uh, uh, much more uh, effort than what we can usually uh, be able to provide for him. So what is a neurodevelopmental disorder? So that neurodevelopmental disorders are defined as uh, any condition that produces deficits in cognitive functioning during developmental period. So there are associated neurological conditions are primarily diagnosed prior to, during, or after birth. So impairments corresponding to the group of disorders vary among um, personal care, uh, as well as emotional, behavioral, social, environmental, and physical components. So there's a whole range of um, things that can happen. So one of the things, this is data from Florida, where you know, uh, I use this data because they have been trying to uh, develop some programs for um, uh, adults with intellectual uh, with the neurodevelopment disorders uh, in the state of Florida. And there was uh, data that was published, uh, which said that, um, so according to the data that was collected uh, by the Agency for Persons with Disability, Intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, uh, Down syndrome, and Porter Valley syndrome were all uh, those six conditions were included in this uh, data. And what they found was in the um, in non institutionalized adults, uh, age 21 to 64. 4.2 percent of individuals had cognitive difficulties and who fell within that, that category. And in 2013, the overall percentage of any disability uh, was 7.7% for Hispanics or Latinos, 21.4% for Native Americans, and 11.6% for um, non-Hispanic and African-American uh, individuals. When we look at the U.S. Census Bureau, there are 1.25 million adults with uh, intellectual um, disability disorder and approximately 2.4 million uh, individuals over the age of 15 who have a disability such as cerebral palsy or autism spectrum disorder. So uh, this is uh, increasingly a problem um, in the adult population. So the, uh, uh, one of the things is that improvements in uh, medical care and living conditions have uh, raised the life expectancy, and um, as particularly in Western countries, uh, the expected age of individuals with Down syndrome uh, with severe disabilities is estimated to be in the mid 50s uh, now. Uh, and um, in 1960, it was 10 years. So, you know, there's a tremendous uh, increase in the life expectancy of these individuals. And uh, in individuals with Down syndrome who have milder, uh, uh, mild to moderate intellectual disability, uh, the life expectancy is now in the early 70s. So these are individuals who are expected to live um, you know, quite long. And so it's important to uh, see that they, what their health uh, problems are going to be. It's also estimated that in 2030, the number of adults over the age of 60 living with IDDs to be around 1.2 million individuals. So. So this is twice the rate from 2000. So this is, you know, in the past, uh, the problems related to neurodevelopmental disorders was primarily considered a pediatric issue. And, um, and even today, uh, internal medicine programs and residencies pay very little attention to this particular uh, set of problems. And uh, it is quite obvious that uh, we need to learn more about these and try to address these problems in a comprehensive way for, for better uh, outcomes. So um, the other thing that we have is that the individuals who have this, um, the, the neurodevelopment disorders, um, who have intellectual disability disorder are at a greater risk for um, health disparities and they require uh, significant support systems. Um, and services for daily function to maintain health and independent living. So it is uh, something that uh, needs to be addressed uh, with policy and uh, social support. So um, we have to provide them uh, adult services and medical needs. Um, so it's important for us to look at those uh, issues. A third of the individuals between the age of 18 to 44 uh, um, who have these um, do not have a 
healthcare provider. A third of them uh, have unmet healthcare needs because of associated cost. And 25% of these uh, individuals between 45 and 64 uh, have not seen anyone um, you know, in the preceding year. So this is certainly a, a problem that needs to be addressed. So one of the things is that this was an uh, article in the New York Times that was published in 2014 uh, about the Lee Specialty Clinic, uh, which is here in Louisville. It's one of the uh, unique places where, uh, which is kind of exclusively de devoted uh, to the care of uh, adults with um, intellectual disabilities. So um, you have a dedicated staff, it's a multidisciplinary clinic, and um, all the patients who come there are adults with neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. And um, now we, um, you know, the, the, in the people there uh, had um, um, been uh, looking for individuals to go and see patients over there, and they had approached us and with Dr. Winters and Dr. Philip May, um, who is the physician who is there. Um, we worked out a way that we could see some patients over there, Dr. Henry Hood and uh, Matt, um, they, uh, Matt Holder, uh, who was then the director of the clinic. Um, so we have been trying to provide um, in a small way because I only go there one half day a month, uh, but really it has uh, made me uh, understand a bit better the uh, extent of the problem. And we have also had uh, opportunities for some of our medical students to learn about this and do some small projects uh, related to uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So, so the prevalence, you know, so one of the things that we have to look at is um, what kind of health condition or problems do they have? And uh, this is a, you know, a, a meta-analysis of uh, several studies. So this um, synthesized uh, about 77 uh, studies which are of moderate to high quality. And the highest prevalence estimates that were um, noted in this population with um, uh, neurointellectual disability um, was related to epilepsy, year and eye disorders, cerebral palsy. So they're mostly, you know, they have neurological disorders, but also they have obesity, osteoporosis, congenital heart defects, and thyroid disorders as one of the common problems that we see. In addition to that, they also have osteoporosis, as uh, as I said here. So uh, it's it's a, a problem within this uh, particular uh, population. So that is something that we have to keep in mind. And this is looking at you know when you look at the uh, population of individuals with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders and look at the top 15 most common physical health conditions. Uh, there are endocrine problems such as thyroid disorders and obesity. Um, so you can see here, of course, it, it varies depending on the uh, particular studies, but a significant number of them, um, you know, almost 60% of them uh, could be uh, obese in this uh, population. Uh, they also have um, other medical problems, including congenital uh, defects uh, and other things that are uh, important. But the cardiovascular risk associated with obesity, overweight, uh, diabetes, and um, thyroid disorders are something that should be uh, kept in mind. This one here, uh, sorry for this, this is the wrong title. This is actually uh, in people with Down syndrome, uh, not with any etiology. This data is for people with Down syndrome. And again, you see here a significant number of them having diabetes, um, in, uh, obesity, thyroid disorders. Uh, these are common problems that we see in individuals who have uh, Down syndrome. So these are the, kind of the common problems that we see in endocrine clinic uh, occurring at a greater, uh, in, a, uh, in a more, uh, more often and in a more severe form in individuals with uh, these uh, disorders. So when you look at cardiometabolic diseases uh, in individuals with autism spectrum uh, disorders, uh, this was a study that was published um, uh, recently in 2023 in JAMA Pediatrics. So they looked at um, 
the uh, association between autism spectrum disorders and cardiomyopathy metabolic disease. Uh, again, it's a systematic review and um, meta-analysis. And what you find here, um, what you will find here is that, um, you know, there were 34 studies that they looked at, you know, 276,000 participants with autism and, you know, uh, even more individuals with uh, without autism. And what they find is that there is a much greater uh, prevalence of diabetes overall. The relative risk is 1.57. And uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, 1.64, and type 2 diabetes, 2.47. So uh, in this group of individuals, you're likely to see uh, much greater prevalence of uh, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And there is also a higher risk of dyslipidemia and heart disease. So um, they uh, also found that um, you know, children with autism were at a greater risk uh, of developing diabetes and hypertension compared uh, with adults. So this risk, what they found was uh, starting very early in the course, in, in, the, in, their, in the life, uh, and progresses increasingly throughout their um, life. So the importance here is that um, the these disorders need to be screened for and addressed uh, at an early age uh, in these uh, individuals with uh, uh, autism spectrum disorders. So that um, when I'll show you some uh, additional data to show how uh, cardiovascular disease occurs at an earlier age and so does uh, diabetes and obesity uh, in uh, individuals with um, neurodevelopmental disorders compared to neurotypical individuals. So um, there is a greater um, disease burden at an early age. So this one here is looking at the, uh, this is a study from Denmark, which looks at uh, overall and type specific cardiovascular disease uh, in um, the population with in, uh, intellectual disability. And this, um, here um, shows you, you know, what is the cumulative incidence. And you can you know these three here. This is those with mild, moderate, and severe intellectual disability. And these are individuals without any intellectual disability. And you can see that there is a significantly higher um, incidence of uh, cardiovascular disease uh, occurring in individuals who have intellectual disability, and particularly those uh, with more severe uh, intellectual disabilities. So uh, that is something um, that um, is further borne out by some of the studies that have been done specifically in certain conditions like Down syndrome, uh, where there is uh, data, uh, particularly with cardiometabolic risk. So um, what we find here is that uh, even if you adjust for their underlying neurodevelopmental disorder and neurologic comorbidities, uh, intellectual disability remains a significant uh, association with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So um, this one here is the same data looking at, you know, um, adjusted and unadjusted uh, hazard ratios, and uh, you find for CVD, whether overall um, in childhood or in adulthood all along, you will find that there is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in individuals with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. <laughs> so this study, um, which was published last year in Diabetes Care, looked at diabetes and obesity in Down syndrome uh, across the lifespan. This is a retrospective uh, cohort uh, study uh, using uh, UK electronic health data. And what you see here uh, is interesting. <coughs> This one here is for um, the the top um, things here is dense. No, so what you can see here these are males, and this one the lower um, frame is the females. And what you see here is that the you know the the rate of diabetes uh, actually is uh, occurs much earlier. You know, so you can see that peaking uh, at around 25, uh, 30 years of age. Uh, whereas in the, um, you know, those without Down syndrome, it is peaking uh, somewhere around in the 50 to uh, 60 uh, year age group. So, so the, you know, 
that this is occurring at an earlier age, uh, both in the male and in the females, much more pronounced um, in the males than in the females. They also looked at obesity. And again, what you see here is that, you know, the, uh, the individuals with Down syndrome have higher weight at a younger age. So these are adults um, over 18 years old. And so you see that their peak uh, uh, weight as a group is uh, around 30 uh, years or so, and subsequently it's, it's lower. And in females, it's a bit uh, later. But you see that that the, the main thing is that the, the weight is much higher um, than the control uh, individuals at an earlier age. So the underlying me mechanism uh, of increased susceptibility uh, for diabetes is still not clear. You know, there is an association with weight. However, when you compare this um, with the uh, non-Down syndrome patients, what you find is that the, um, the control population actually have a greater association with weight than the Down syndrome population. So it seems to be that there is additional um, risk related to Down syndrome, which is independent of their weight. So uh, we don't know all the mechanism, but we do know that there is a predisposition to autoimmunity. I'll show you some data looking at type 1 diabetes and in Down syndrome. There are also you know, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, increased oxidative stress, um, and cellular dysfunction. Uh, these are all thought to be additional risks, and there are some um, candidate genes that are associated uh, with Down syndrome, which may also be contributing to the higher uh, uh, you know, frequent uh, prevalence of diabetes uh, in this uh, population. So um, there is some data that there is a decrease in beta cell mass and impaired insulin secretion in Down syndrome, but really the, the basic underlying mechanisms are still not clear. So if you look at those with trisomy 21, uh, there is also another type of uh, interesting disorder that we see, uh, which is permanent neonatal diabetes that is autoimmune, but not HLA associated. So uh, when they looked at them, so these are individuals who develop um, uh, what, we, what looks like type 1 diabetes early on. They have islet autoantibodies, um, but uh, these were not associated with HLA type. So uh, they are different from the typical permanent neonatal diabetes that you see in individuals without Down syndrome. So again, you know, the, the exact mechanism by which uh, this occurs um, is, is something that is not fully uh, understood, but this is something that has been uh, reported. So type 2 diabetes is a thing that is um, most commonly seen in this group of individuals, uh, you know, those with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and you know, they pose some challenges, and there has been a lot of effort to try and see how can we improve their uh, management. You know? um, so the people with um, intellectual disabilities, they do experience significant barriers of diabetes self-management. But there is actually not much data on how to address these because the basic underlying um, barriers are not well studied. So this is again a meta-analysis. Um, and I must say that most of the data that we have um, in this field are uh, only in the last five to eight years that people have been writing about it. Uh, and uh, as I said, there are a couple of reasons for it. One is that you know, more and more people are um, living longer, and therefore this is a thing that we see. Uh, and because of that, the second thing is that people have been interested in trying to address this, and only recently has there been attention paid to uh, looking at this from a research perspective to see how can, we can address this. So, you know, um, this, these four are the main things that we have. Um, and you know some of these things are common to individuals, even individuals who don't have um, developmental disorders and intellectual disability, do express frustration over lifestyle adjustment, limited understanding and inadequate educational resources, limited training and knowledge of the staff, and potential for effective uh, DSM with appropriate support. 
So these are major barriers. Uh, we face that even in the regular clinics, but these are accentuated in individuals with um, intellectual disorders. So uh, it is important to be able to provide you know, structured education to improve health literacy uh, for people with uh, intellectual disorders, uh, together with training for caregivers, which is very important. You know, um, because they need to be uh, autonomous. So that's why you know, we need to address this particular issue um, you know, uh, of providing more support for care of uh, diabetes in these individuals. When you look at this thing here, you know, um, so this is mainly related to mild um, intellectual disorders. Uh, because for the more severe ones, it is more difficult to address them uh, directly. Individuals with mild intellectual disorders are capable of uh, following some of the instructions and being able to um, learn some skills uh, much more than those with moderate to severe uh, intellectual disabilities. So you need to train and ensure consistency and flexibility uh, approaches from caregivers. So this is something that I think uh, one uh, has to develop uh, over time. And again, you know, uh, both in the city and in the state, we do not have enough uh, resources for us to be able to train individuals uh, who can provide this kind of um, care to help with uh, management of these uh, disorders. Now, this is particularly more so if you look at uh, young adults with uh, type 1 diabetes, because type 1 diabetes uh, requires a even more self-management skills in terms of blood sugar monitoring, in terms of taking injections. So, um, so it is complex, so carbohydrate counting, blood glucose monitoring, insulin therapy. Um, so, and again, there's a lot of reliance on parents and caregivers. Um, you know, uh, as adult endocrinologists and internists, uh, we are not used to um, talking to parents about care, uh, whereas pediatrics, uh, you know, they are much more um, used to talking to uh, caregivers and parents on care. So this is something that we need to learn to be able to provide better care for individuals uh, with um, neurodevelopmental disorders. The other problem, of course, is uh, obesity. Um, and you know, uh, this is an uh, example of, um, you know, the prader willi syndrome, where there are multiple uh, issues, but they're both um, causes and uh, consequences of um, uh, uh, obesity. Um, so, you know, the there are um, alterations in energy, energy homeostasis, uh, poor adherence to lifestyle uh, change, and use of psychotropic medications. This is an important thing uh, because many of these individuals are on medications that uh, make it more difficult to um, lose weight. They promote weight gain. Uh, they may have um, growth hormone deficiency, lactin resistance, uh, and of course, you know, hypothyroidism and several untreated uh, abnormalities, uh, which can lead to weight gain and uh, metabolic disturbance. So this is, uh, uh, you know, this was published last year, looking at um, uh, diet um, in patients with prader willi syndrome. Uh, and you can see that there's only one study that I found, which was in adults. Uh, the others were in children. And um, a very modest uh, weight loss, you know, uh, in, uh, at three years. So it is not a very... Uh, effective uh, method. Uh, this is a retrospective cohort study. Now, um, this was um, the general plan that we have here is to you know, use different therapeutic options that we have for the management of obesity in these individuals. Um, in addition to that, you know, um, weight loss surgery has been used and um, the, it is unclear. Um, it has, you know, there have been case reports where they have reported that bariatric surgery in prader willi will work and cause significant weight loss. However, um, in a, there is no systematic study and um, uh, people are still hesitant to recommend uh, bariatric surgery for these individuals. 
As far as the anti-obesity drugs, such as DLP-1 analogs, uh, they can be used in um, support of nutritional therapy. And um, this was published just uh, this year, uh, looking at liraglutide for weight management in children and adolescents with Prader-Willi syndrome. And it was kind of disappointing in the sense that it actually did not cause a significant uh, weight loss. Although, you know, they said that the, um, uh, it, there was a decrease in the hyperphagia uh, score and also in the uh, drive to eat scores, uh, and it needs to be further uh, evaluated. So we actually don't know how effective it will be. I haven't seen a study with uh, uh, semaglutide for prader willi syndrome. So this is the, you know, uh, as far as the management from the point of view of uh, uh, treatments are concerned, you know, for weight. Um, so these are what we call syndromic obesities. Uh, many of them have neurodevelopmental disorders. So with prader willi they have tried liraglutide mostly in children and case. There's one case report uh, with liraglutide where the individual lost over 100 pounds uh, over 10 years. Then you have exenatide. Uh, they have also used this one case report with deep brain stimulation, intranasal oxytocin, and another drug, which is methionine aminopeptidase inhibitor. I'm not sure exactly the mechanism by which these work. Um, these are kind of in early stages of studies. With the Bard and Beal syndrome, uh, there's this new drug, uh, set melanotide, which is MC4R um, and, uh, agonist, which uh, is approved for use in Bard and Beal syndrome uh, and uh, has been shown to cause significant weight loss. And the same drug is being studied for diff, uh, other conditions like uh, Armstrong syndrome, Smith-Margenis syndrome, um, and this uh, 11, 16 p 11.2 deletion. Uh, so these drugs have been used. In pseudohypoparathyroidism, there was one case report of using Remonoband. Uh, however, Remonoband has been withdrawn from the market, so it's not something that we uh, use. So there is limited data on the use of um, these medications uh, for uh, weight management. So this is a, a, a study that uh, we had done uh, at the Lee Clinic, looking at comorbidities and association with uh, you know, body composition in adults. And this really, uh, what we were interested in, not just obesity, but a change in body composition. So what we found here is that um, in individuals who had um, you know, neurodevelopmental disorders, there was significantly higher BMI. They also had, so this is the, the blue ones are the females and the red ones are the male. Um, so what you find is that the average BMI was higher, um, the percent body fat was higher, um, and they had lower skeletal mass and higher truncal fat. So the body composition in these individuals um, were uh, skewed towards more body fat uh, and less um, uh, muscle mass. When you look at the BMI categories, one of the things that we see here is that, you know, there are not as many healthy weight individuals. In fact, the healthy weight and overweight are more in the, in the control population. But you see that there is a significant shift towards individuals who are plus one, two, and three obesity. And you can see here that over 20, it's, I think it's more 22% or so of individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities were severely overweight, so which is much more than the uh, control population. So there's a high, uh, kind of a skewed representation of this. They also have common uh, disorders such as abnormal lipids, which were more common, uh, hypertension, diabetes, and uh, sleep apnea. And again, you must remember that these are younger individuals. So um, their uh, mean age was around 32 or 33. So uh, for that population, this is a higher percentage of abnormal glucose. And the other thing that we see um, is that there is a, a relationship between, you know, when we looked at uh, liver enzymes, you know, um, there is an association between their body composition. That means that their ALT was uh, related to higher BMI, higher percent body fat, and higher truncal fat mass, and with lower skeletal mass. So this is something that uh, indicates that this is one of the 
uh, key abnormalities. So it's not just their weight itself, but their body composition is such that they have more adipose tissue, more truncal fat, and less uh, skeletal muscle. So uh, although they you know, may not meet strict definition of uh, sarcopenia, they are uh, in the, uh, they, they are trending towards the sarcopenic range. So different ways of trying to address this in addition to dietary and uh, interventions and medications for weight is to address physical activity. So one of the additional problems that these individuals have is their low level of physical activity. So sedentary um, you know, activity, I mean, sedentary lifestyle is very highly prevalent and physical activity uh, in, in a meaningful way, it was only reported in about nine to 10 percent of individuals with um, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So one of the things that is um, recently been proposed um, um, as a way to improve it um, is to use um, progressive resistance uh, exercise training to reduce cardiovascular disease. And this is a study that has, um, uh, it has just started um, and it's uh, in the Netherlands and it is a 12 week baseline period. Uh, then, you know, uh, it's a 24 weeks um, of uh, progressive resistance exercise training and then to analyze the multiple effects of these, and this is underway. Then there is another uh, hypothesis, which is that uh, what we call small steps in fitness. So uh, these individuals have such low levels of physical activity um, that they are an extremely unfit population. So it may be, I mean, these individuals may not be able to reach the what we uh, consider as uh, uh, ideal uh, amounts of physical activity. So there is some data to support that even small differences uh, at the lowered physical fitness uh, spectrum are associated with health benefits. So now when you look at this, this is the uh, population. Um, this is the fitness measured as VO2 max. Um, so this is women and this is men. And uh, you can see here that these are the individuals at different ages of um, the individuals with um, um, neurodevelopmental disorders, and this is the uh, average for the general population. So they are way below the um, what the general population is. So this is an unknown um, box uh, where the hypothesis is that even if we uh, take these individuals and push them here, uh, even though they are at the lower end of the normal population in terms of their uh, fitness level, they will actually get health benefits. So the hypothesis is that their uh, health benefits will increase substantially, that there's a steeper curve here than when you increase it within the, uh, in the healthy population. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. So instead of aiming for uh, intense activity, you know, even small amounts of activity uh, may be helpful. The other problem that we often face is one of osteoporosis. Um, so, you know, Dr. May um, uh, uh, at the Lee Clinic has done some work both here and when he was in New Jersey, looking at bone density and uh, effects of, uh, uh, of intellectual disorders. Uh, and also, of course, with um, uh, some exercise or uh, other interventions. So um, there's early onset of uh, osteoporosis in these uh, individuals. Uh, and you know, management, we still don't know, uh, but, um, you know, the uh, the next figure here. So when you look at this population again, what you see here is the early uh, increase in the rate of fractures. So this is women with intellectual disabilities and this is men with uh, intellectual disabilities. And you see here that you see that difference occurring you know, at an earlier age um, in individuals with um, intellectual disabilities. So uh, there, there are multiple risk factors, including lack of physical activity, uh, lower muscle mass, um, and also use of some of the medications that are an anticonvulsant uh, medications, which all predispose them. And then there are nutritional factors, uh, such as vitamin D deficiency, um, which uh, um, and the lack of physical activity, all of these contribute to the higher risk. And uh, even when adjusted for that, there is a higher risk. So there's something that uh, needs to be uh, evaluated. 
So, so this is a very nice review that, um, article that was written about two years ago, and this talks about what every internist should know about rare genetic syndromes um, in order to prevent needless. So, um, so this is a, you know, this is a clinic um, in Australia where they looked at. Um, uh, this is a rare genetic syndromes uh, clinic, and they looked at their population there. So, you know, this is a complex genetic syndrome. They have combined medical problems. Uh, intellectual disability and challenging behaviors are often part of it. And then most children receive multidisciplinary care. And once they become 18 or 21 years, they move on. But then there is nobody to take care of them. So, um, so one of the things that they looked at is try to find out what what are the types of disorders that they have, and you know what should be done about it. So in this particular clinic, you see the different uh, disorders. So they are alphabetically named. So there were 720 individuals with their genetic disorders that they were following in the clinic, and you can see that some of the common things that we saw was uh, Klinefelter syndrome, neurofibromatosis, prader willi um, then they had Turner's, they had tuberous sclerosis, and then some uh, a group of unknown syndromes, and Williams syndrome, so um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and then all the others are only very few of these. But again, this is important to recognize because um, you know th these kinds of syndromes, um, in the, the individuals are again living longer and are more often seen in our clinics than we used to see in the past. So we have to. Now, um, so this is one of the things about it is that when you look at it, um, there is a significant number of these syndromes where there is an endocrine problem. So when you look at this, you know, um, whether it is obesity, or thyroid disorders, um, or bone disease, or short stature, or hypogonadism. So there's a whole range of, uh, or osteoporosis. So you can see that um, you know, these syndromes, many of these syndromes are associated with endocrine disorders. And simultaneously, they also have uh, intellectual disorder as a common um, you know, thing. So uh, one of the things for us is that as endocrinologists, we are likely to see many of these syndromes. So this is a list of um, the 720 patients that they had. So what you find here is that uh, this is a thing that uh, we are likely to see. So, so the main thing that you want to do is to uh, have a system where you have someone uh, who can do the uh, initial evaluation. And genetic testing has now become a very useful and important tool in trying to diagnose these uh, conditions. And I'll talk about it briefly in, in one of the uh, slides that I have of our four patients with a rare uh, genetic syndrome. And so, you know, you, you can diagnose them with um, genetic testing. And then, you know, depending on this, I mean, this one here takes the example of hypertension, but then, you know, you have to look for um, an internist and endocrinologist, this is the intellectual I mean, uh, disabilities uh, specialist, and then the neuropsychologist, dietitian, physical therapist. So that system uh, for each of these syndromes, one needs to have this particular setup and developing a pathway for uh, addressing these syndromes so that they get the appropriate um, care, you know, because you know, once you have that genetic diagnosis, uh, look for the proper uh, set of abnormalities that may be there, uh, and that then we can address those uh, appropriately. Now, this is a, uh, you know, if people have not read this, I would strongly recommend them. I know Dr. Winters is uh, here uh, listening, and he, he wrote this very nice article, uh, Hypogonadism in Males with Genetic uh, Neurodevelopmental Syndrome. So again, here there are neurodevelopmental disorders, and there's a genetic syndrome that is associated. And, um, you know, of course, when, when I presented initially, we talked about prader willi where there is an associated uh, hypogonadism, but it's also uh, has neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. So as mentioned here, you know, um, many of these genetic syndromes affect testicular function uh, and also um, there are neurological signs and symptoms uh, and, you know, uh, we may not be able to 
we may not pay much attention to the hypogonadism and other uh, abnormalities that may be there. So um, these are the, um, the syndromes that were described, uh, looking at what their uh, clinical manifestations are, the specific mutations uh, that have been uh, demonstrated in, in these conditions, and also, you know, uh, what are their uh, neurological and uh, clinical manifestations? I won't go through all of them, but I would refer you to read that article, which is great, you know. So, you know, these are very uncommon. So even for experts. So this is something when you have a, a, a clinic that does rare genetic disorders, uh, this is something that you pay attention to collect the information and keep the things uh, uh, so that uh, we can um, learn from other uh, reports and also add to the literature. Um, so genetic sequencing really has changed patient care uh, and is continuously growing in importance. Uh, the other thing that we have is that, um, you know, it is, you can provide better genetic advice and counseling for patients and families once you have a proper, um, you know, uh, diagnosis. It also will open ways for studying the molecular mechanisms of hypogonadism in general and also for neurodevelopmental disorders. Now, why are these occurring together? And, um, you know, uh, there are lots of studies looking at different conditions and we can, uh, if you know the genetic diagnosis, uh, it will be easier to address these. In fact, um, this is the, when you look at Prader-Willi syndrome, there is a spectrum, you know. So in addition to the classic Prader-Willi, um, there is a Prader-Willi-like pheno and genotype, you know. So this um, uh, review, which was also published in Endocrine Reviews uh, last year, looked at a whole bunch of uh, conditions where, you know, there is a classic uh, genotype uh, and there are multiple, there are different syndromes where you have a 2P deletion, the Temple syndrome, 6Q deletion, uh, 19p deletion. So these are different abnormalities which have um, similar phenotype as the Prader Willi. Um, so um, you know, this particular review looked at all these different entities uh, and said that um, you know while Prader Willi syndrome refers to a specific um, pattern of uh, chromosome 15q, 11q, uh, 13 region. Uh, there are other uh, abnormal, uh, abnormal, uh, genetic abnormalities which present in, in a similar fashion. So, you know, most of these um, can be diagnosed with a single nucleotide polymorphism array, but syndromes such as Turner Temple syndrome, Schaff Young, will need additional testing, you know. So, uh, it is important to recognize this and, you know, have a multidisciplinary approach because these syndromes have more than one system that is uh, affected. So, um, so coming to this particular thing, you know, uh, the reason I brought that up, uh, this particular uh, uh, study which we did was, um, this is a set of four patients with a rare disorder called the Phelan McDermott syndrome. So Phelan McDermott syndrome is a syndrome with a mutation in the Shank 3 gene. And um, it has a wide uh, range of clinical manifestations. One of the things here, and I'll show it this here. So most of these patients will present with global developmental delay. They have hypotonia. Um, and then there's also some of these features on their face, on the hands, which might lead you to think about this particular condition. Um, in this situation, they said less than 25% of patients, it says 5% had hypothyroidism. However, in our uh, uh, you know, group of four individuals, three of them were hypothyroid. So, you know, um, so, so the manifestations and, uh, from these different uh, reports uh, could be uh, variable. So um, one of the things that has been studied um, is also looking at how they can be treated. And um, some of the studies looking at the use of uh, oxytocin uh, as a treatment um, has been uh, has some you know uh, results which are uh, interesting. They're not conclusive. There are a few patients in whom there has been symptomatic improvement, 
But again, if you know a genetic diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental disorder, then it is possible for us to do um, to explore that. You know, so um, this is the uh, general care that you know people have recommended. Um, so you can have a center, a regional care team, primary health provider, and you know, uh, this is the patient, the pediatrician who diagnoses it and and that's. Um, Short stature, uh, yes, they also have short stature. Yeah. So, um, so this is the general model for rare uh, neurogenetic disorders in terms of trying to get uh, personalized uh, medicine. So, uh, if you want to have a more comprehensive care, uh, you need to have, you know, a center that is um, doing multiple things, including screening patients, providing therapy, you know, so the diagnosis, therapy and care, and then also getting into phenotyping, you know, studying the molecular basis, uh, whatever the animal models that may be there, new therapies. So this needs to be part of an uh, integrated uh, system so, so that we can do better um, because there are new methodologies, care networks and collaborative frameworks uh, that can optimize care of these uh, individuals. So, you know, when just to recap here, you know, in the 1800s, you know, the individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, you know, they, the, the diagnosis was idiocy or idiotic sevens, or, you know, so the, those were the terms that were used. And now we have the move to move them in the spectrum of a hypothetical genetic neurodevelopmental continuum that includes intellectual disabilities, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, and uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorders. So um, the basis for these are being developed. So just to summarize, uh, individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders are living longer. More adults with these disorders are seen in clinical practice. Many common endocrine disorders and cardiometabolic risk factors are present, more commonly in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, limited data uh, on approaches to reduce CVD risk is available. Rare genetic syndromes are uh, often associated with endocrine disorders and intellectual disability. Uh, endocrinologists and internists with specific expertise in diagnosis and management of these disorders will need to be trained. And then a multidisciplinary approach to provide optimal care is needed. And more research is needed in understanding the underlying mechanisms uh, of these disorders. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. May, who um, is kind of uh, very passionate about this. He has been involved in the care of these uh, individuals for more than three decades. Steve Winters, uh, he um, you know, negotiated with them, was interested in this and uh, uh, helped collect some of the data that uh, I presented uh, to you. Paula Robinson is the primary care physician at the Lee Clinic. Um, she's one of the most knowledgeable persons and caring individual for these uh, patients. Dr. Compton and Cornell uh, have been um, directors of the clinic, and of course, the staff and patients at the Lee Specialty Clinic. Uh, medical students who recently worked last year and uh, the year before, Sydney Cronmayer and Charmy Shaw, and also for the Inter International Federation for Chronic Disabilities that funded the uh, medical student uh, research program. So this is the CME code for today, and I'll stop here and we'll be uh, happy to take some questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very unique. I mean, it was a New York Times, so nationally and internationally, this living has, you know, the uh, global that's it's on the map. So. Uh, since it's a very geographically uh, close group of individuals, have they looked back at in terms of uh, you know pathogenesis and all that? Like, is it environmental? Is it uh, consanguinity sort of the risk factors to and the frequency? You said we had four uh, EMS PMD patients, and that is so rare. So, can you comment a little bit on that? Yeah, so the question was about, you know, have looked at, uh, you know, causes of these uh, disorders and what kind of um, 
environmental factors so those can be there. Uh, I didn't talk about this, but one of the other areas between uh, of uh, um, overlap between endocrine endocrinology and uh, autism spectrum disorders and is the role of endocrine disrupting chemicals and how they could lead to some of these disorders. With specific reference to the Phelan McDermott syndrome, uh, that is more of a genetic uh, disorder rather than uh, uh, environmental factors. However, there may be an overlap because the actual clinical manifestations uh, do vary, uh, and that may be related to additional environmental factors that may play a role in how um, and what kind of phenotype uh, will be there in uh, addition to the actual genome. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Correct. For the autism spectrum disorder, uh, because it's a very broad term, you know, uh, it's often difficult to pin it down and, and say. You know. Then, um, so uh, with all the new things, with the, you said the obesity, uh, the GLP ones are not as effective like you see in the other studies. Uh, but uh, what about like gut microbiome? So uh, the question was, what about gut microbiome uh, and other things? Yes, again. You know, in the autism spectrum disorder also, um, there is a lot of literature talking about the relationship between gut microbiome and uh, either both the development, severity, and progression of autism spectrum disorder. So there is data on that. Uh, but none of them have come to the point where one can say uh, a particular um, intervention has been dramatically helpful. There are small case reports or uh, some studies that are very early mechanistic rather than uh, talking about you know um, more broad effects that uh, they may have so um, that's the uh, thing that we have so the one of the problems in studying this uh, particular uh, group of uh, individuals is that they are a vulnerable population trying to do studies in them um, with uh, difficult, uh, it's more difficult. Uh, one has to be careful uh, on some of them. They may not be able to express the, uh, some of the side effects that they may notice, uh, or you know, if they have you know, um, other you know, issues related to the drug, you know, that's something that is more difficult in these. So most of them, that most of the studies are in um, those with milder forms of intellectual disability. You know. Uh, and more observational rather than intervention. Now they are each, uh, like life, life expectancy is almost catching up with general population. And I know many of them come from close family members and if they, it's mostly parents or uh, elders. So what happens when the parents are, uh, they come to these ones? Correct. I mean, so one of the questions that is raised was, you know, uh, who cares for them and what about the parents and, uh, uh, you know, who are taking care of them? And so the, the thing is that, yes, that is one of the biggest concerns uh, that is there for both the parents um, and, of course, in general for caregivers, um, what happens to them. And that is uh, a key factor in their care. Um, so, you know, it's important to uh, develop networks uh, which are uh, reliable. Um, so, you know, there is no uh, perfect system at this point uh, that that helps them, but certainly that is something that we have to keep in mind. Uh, so, there's a question here about um, the. Do you think it is appropriate to prescribe? Um, liraglutide and semaglutide in non-diabetic individuals with um, uh, intellectual disability. Yeah, I mean, of course we are using it. Um, they are weight loss uh, uh, medications at this point. They are approved for um, weight loss and uh, they are the more effective medications. So that is not a problem as such at this point, but they have not been studied in these syndromic uh, obesities, except the one that I showed you where it wasn't very effective, um, which was liraglutide. Uh, and then set melanotide um, has been approved, um, but it has a limited use for a specific, um, either 
um, with barded beetle or perhaps with a genetic mutation with the MC4R gene. So uh, otherwise it's not something uh, that is uh, approved. Um, so, um, Well, so there are many attempts to try and, you know, the, the other question was attempts to correct um, uh, ID, the genetic predisposition with CRISPR. Uh, there, there are multiple different methods that people have used to try and see if they can identify uh, early on what the defect is so that they can plan better. Uh, and I don't know specifically with, with CRISPR uh, whether it has been addressed or not. Uh, you know, this is something I think the pediatrics people uh, would be more familiar with because they deal with it. Uh, we deal with these patients uh, way after uh, the. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we deal with this problem at a much later date than the uh, pediatric population as such. Well, just thank you, Sri, for a very lucid uh, and, of course, novel <laughs> MEC. We have never discussed this before, and I appreciate you commenting on my paper. And Phil May, I know, is exhilarated uh, by you selecting to do this. And I hope maybe the members who are listening, who are Endocrine Society members, might suggest to the Endocrine Society that this would be a wonderful topic uh, for an Endocrine Society symposium, since there are so many endocrine issues that you uh, raised. So please think of that. Thanks so much. Yeah, I know. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think that's very uh, important uh, for the endocrine society to recognize uh, this growing uh, problem and try to develop this further. Uh, that'd be very useful. But certainly your article was so detailed and well researched. You know, <laughs> I was impressed about all the references and the details of the mechanisms and everything that you had written in that. You know? uh, would strongly recommend it to all our fellows and others, not just for understanding this problem, but I think some of the mechanisms that you had discussed over there, uh, which are still out there. I mean, why do these two things occur together? What is the common mechanisms? You know, uh, that is still a big question. 